Thanks for coming this morning. My name's David LaRocca. Life is the sum of all your choices. Kind of think about that. Life is the sum of all your choices. Not being able to access a good home absolutely impacts opportunity. It absolutely impacts choice and it impacts people's ability to live up to what they want to be. So we want to start a conversation this morning around this big topic of housing affordability. And we think we kind of need to shift the conversation. We think we need to sh shift the conversation perhaps away from housing affordability to housing accessibility. And what we mean by that is creating more options for people to access a good home. We want to involve you in this conversation this morning. We want to come up with some uh, credible ideas or at least a credible plan of attack. And we're going to do that uh, uh, later this morning. Now you're all probably wondering why have we got a Monopoly board uh, up on the screen? Now remember when you all played Monopoly, the first thing you'd do was fight over the tokens. Um, who, who was a car person? I was absolutely about grabbing the car. What about the dog? Little Scottish Terrier. A few dogs in the room. That sounds a bit inappropriate, but a few dogs in the room. What about the top hat? Anyone a top hat person? Peter Crone. Peter's our chief economist. Was always going to be a chief economist when you're picking uh, the top hat when you're playing Monopoly. Um, and we think, bring this, um, think about your property strategies. I was about dominating the corner, the, the Piccadillys, the yellows and the greens. Um, my brother was about absolutely going all in on, uh, on the reds, the Strand, Fleet Street. Who was around going all in on Park Lane and Mayfair? Yeah, I hate that. That was over when you hit Park Lane and Mayfair. <laughs> Let's bring this back to the real life monopoly. Think about where we're all at in our real life monopoly. I don't think there's many Northumberlands, um, Old Kent Roads in the room here. I think there's probably some Piccadillys, Leicester Squares, there might even be some Mayfairs and Park Lanes lurking in the room here around your property situation. I guess what I'm trying to say here is housing affordability probably doesn't impact us personally uh, at the stage of our life, but it absolutely impacts the people we're trying to attract to our firms, it impacts our families, our friends, and it impacts our communities. Now obviously this is a complex space, our politicians are attuned to it, you're all attuned to the key issues. Uh, what we want to do this morning is get into a creative discussion with you, some new thinking around this topic. And we think the new thinking needs to revolve around, uh, Peter if you go to the next slide. We think the new thinking needs to be revolve around these three broader questions. Around what does livability, what does good look like around livability in our cities? What does better planning and regulation look like? And what does expanding access, expanding choice look like? All around the goal of providing more access for people to access uh, uh, more uh, housing. Peter. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, I'm Peter Crone, EY's Chief Economist for Oceania. Uh, I just want to paint a little bit of a backdrop uh, about what's happening in the housing market with a, a particular focus, uh, particular focus on Sydney. Uh, I am an economist, so you'd expect me, I suppose, to say it's a matter of demand and supply. Uh, over the last uh, decade or so, on the demand side, you've had strong population growth. Uh, you've also had very low interest rates uh, and reasonable income growth. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that on the supply side, uh, things just haven't kept up with it. Uh, certainly we know in Sydney that um, you know, there's a fixed supply of land and essentially a fixed supply of houses in the areas that people uh, most desire to live in. And you know, one of the things, uh, as we think about this, uh, that, that China can't do. China can't produce more land within an 8k radius of the, uh, the, the, the Sydney CBD. And so again, I think that highlights one of the problems. But one of the other things that's happened uh, in, in Sydney over the last sort of decade or so has been uh, underbuilding. Haven't been enough, uh, lots of greenfield uh, uh, land released, uh, not enough houses built. Uh, it sort of picked up a bit the la last year. There was something like 10,000 new lots uh, in, the, in the greenfields areas, but that was up from only 3,500 in 2006 and you can see a comparison with what happened in Melbourne over that similar period. Melbourne released a lot more land uh, and as a consequence you can see the average land price uh, in Melbourne is a lot lower uh, than Sydney for the Greenfields areas. But also a similar situation happens in terms of um, developable, developable land uh, in some of the inner areas which are, which are quite, uh, uh, quite sought after. You can see uh, in uh, Mascot for example it's almost $4,000 a square metre compared with compared with uh, Brunswick and Melbourne. Uh, the other thing about, I mean, the future is very, very uncertain, but uh, from an economics perspective, when you look at demographics and population, you've got a bit of an idea of what's likely, what's likely to happen. And we know that the, um, the uh, Greater Sydney Commission uh, has put out projections that over the next 20 years or so, um, Sydney's population is going to increase by one and three quarter million people. 
uh, and that's going to require something like 725,000 new homes to be built over the next 20 years. Uh, and if you think that uh, today the housing stock in Sydney is something like 1.7 million uh, homes, uh, so this is a 40% increase, so you're going to have to see something like 35,000 net new homes built each year uh, for the next 20 years. So that provides a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, a backdrop. Um, actually, you know, housing affordability has got a lot more moving pieces, it's a lot more complicated than that, uh, but I think that that backdrop just provides a, a bit of a basis for uh, the discussion. So let me touch on the human dimension, which I think is really important around creating more options for people to access a good home. Um, if you think about it, location, lifestyle, good living, it's all shaped our identities. And so a big part of this is getting the livability of our cities right. So uh, EY Sweeney recently did a study uh, or a survey around what citizens want in their cities. Now clearly affordability plays a big part in this. But you look at the other, the other five things, agility, amenity, safety, spaces, opportunity, they absolutely touch on the human aspects, the broader discussion around what shapes our identity. Um, research shows that people prefer townhouses, apartments, semi-detached homes in the middle or inner part of Sydney to houses in the outer part of Sydney. And the Grattan Institute says that we've only got a, that's 14 per cent of the stock meets that criteria against a demand of about 25 per cent. Uh, so clearly the, these um, uh, these are key issues when we're, when we're thinking about livability. The, the, so if you bring it back to the broader discussion of what does this mean for smart design of our cities, which we think is important in this debate. The smart design of our cities is around better transport and infrastructure, better community spaces and better social services and social infrastructure, which often, which often gets lost in the, in the housing discussion. So we think these things are, are critical when we start a discussion around creating more options for people to access a good home. Oh, and sorry, I've forgotten about Gavin's quote. We, and look, this really uh, is a quote from Gavin Stockland, who runs apartments, uh, the apartment bi business and residential business at Stockland. And I think really captures the human dimensions, the human dimension really well. Uh, the, re the broader conversations we need to be having around uh, creating uh, more access uh, for, for housing in Sydney. So if we um, come to a landing that, um, uh, you know, location and lifestyle are key for livability, I guess the, uh, the question then becomes what do you need to do to expand the range of, of choices, expand the, uh, you know, the options for people to meet their, their housing preferences. Uh, and I know at the start we, um, we use the monopoly analogy uh, and sort of going back to that uh, for those of you who uh, remember the game, if you own all three uh, uh, properties in the one colour, uh, if you've got the money, if your judgement dictates yes, it would be a good strategic decision. Uh, you've got a choice of a, a greenhouse and if you're, if you're lucky uh, you know, you can put a, a hotel on as well, but I wonder whether we might not be able to expand the, 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 the range of um, housing choices that, that are available. And so if I think um, of some of the things that you could do, well it actually isn't expanding the, the range of choices, but going back to, um, you know, the need for uh, more greenfield uh, um, lots to be released. Uh, part of the uh, Greater Sydney Commission's plan, they've got the, the Western Parkland City, uh, something like 210,000 new uh, homes out that way. Well, that's going to be uh, a hell of a lot of um, hell of a lot of new uh, new uh, greenfields homes uh, in some of the outer areas. Uh, and as we think about that, we need to make sure that you get the developer charges right, the infrastructure charges. Uh, maybe you need to make sure you get the rezoning of the uh, the new land supply. Uh, issues like that. How do you um, you know ensure that the the, the the places go, the houses go uh, in, in in the right place? Uh, so that's one issue. Uh, a second issue, and um, David touched on this, is the importance of uh, getting more uh, suburban infill. Uh, suburban infill. So um, a few years ago, actually last year, the Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, did a paper uh, for the Premier and he, he cited some research in there that if there were no planning restrictions uh, in the inner, inner areas, you could do something like 600,000 new homes. Now, of course, we're not going to say there shouldn't be any planning restrictions, but I guess the point is you need to get the uh, you need to get the balance there right. You know, we're all for sort of clearer rules around development, but they actually need to be non-flexible. It's quite rare that an economist says you need to be non-flexible, so you give people a lot of certainty about what's going to be an acceptable development uh, and what's not. And so, getting that's going to be uh, quite important in terms of expanding the range of choices. But if we think uh, perhaps a bit more outside the square. Um, you know, uh, in, in the past you've thought of uh, renting as just a, a temporary step. 
uh, just uh, while you, you, you're putting down your roots or waiting till you, you get a bit more settled. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's sort of it's being thought of a temporary option, but increasingly this day and age, uh, more people in, in middle age and more families with children uh, are choosing to rent. In Sydney, perhaps not so much for choice, maybe partly that, but something like 70% of uh, people aged between 25 and 34 are renting. Uh, you know, should we th start thinking about changing the mindset about renting? You know, in um, Europe, uh, a lot of countries, you've got these longer term leases. So in, in Australia, a typical lease is sort of six to 12 months. You know, can we uh, put out there a viable option? Uh, people want to feel a bit settled. If they could perhaps sign a, a six or a seven or a 10 year lease, uh, it might ex expand their range of, uh, a range of possibilities. Another one, this is where it starts to get sort of a bit newer, uh, a bit exciting, a bit innovative, is in the, what's known the build to rent. How do you get more institutional investors uh, involved in the, in the private rental market? Uh, this thing's starting to take off in, uh, in, uh, in um, the UK. Uh, in the US, you find these uh, institutional landlords with hundreds of thousands of, of, of properties. Uh, and the, uh, the beauty of this is you can actually uh, pick the right houses in the right place uh, at the right price, um, providing some new opportunities. But also going back to some of the things that David talked about, when you design these build to rent or multifamily living properties, they're actually deliberately designed with a sense of community, have sort of common spaces. Uh, and so that could be a big opportunity. As I said, there's a, I think there's a lot of interest in Australia for these sorts of things, but unfortunately, uh, we haven't had much support from some of the policy makers. Uh, and again, there's a whole range of impediments sitting in place and do we need to uh, change those? Do we need to sort of convince some of the policy makers and politicians that this is a real uh, viable option? Uh, and then the last one is, um, you know, can we think about using technology? Uh, you know, with the uh, digital transition we're going through this day and age, uh, ownership's a bit less important than it once was. You know, you're going from, um, you know, things you purchase to uh, access that you subscribe to. And, um, you know, we're starting to see, um, you know, some of these uh, subscription models uh, with, you know, your, your videos, with your music. Uh, is it completely out of the question that you might not start thinking about a subscription service for housing? Uh, we've already got fractional ownership of cars coming in. Uh, it's not going to happen, uh, you know, tomorrow or the next time, but uh, it, might be, uh, it might be something that's worthwhile thinking about uh, a bit further down the track. So there's just a, a, a couple of ideas just to uh, expand the, the, the range of choices. Uh, early thinking yet. Um, you know, we've got to convince a few people, the, uh, the people who set up the game, this is going to be a viable option. Um, but actually, uh, you know, in fact, it, it might help uh, expand the, the, the range of choices in, in real life for a lot of people. Thanks. So clearly all of this um, is, requires a changing mindset, quite a big changing mindset. Um, you know, what we call the housing ladder has kind of been ingrained in all of us uh, in, our, in our lives. Um, what, the ultimate goal of owning a house. Uh, now most of us are probably towards the top of this, hopefully not right at the top of this, uh, but towards the top of this. It's all about owning the house and certainly from my perspective, I grew up in a very traditional Italian family. It was completely about owning your house. In fact, my dad drilled into me, you're going to pay cash for your house, you're not going to incur any debt. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a significant mindset shift here. Let's hear from our millennials because we might, this is the challenge we've got around, uh, around shifting mindset, I guess. I think my mum, when she was a couple years older than I am now, had put down a deposit for a house. Um, and I looked into it recently to borrow money, and the amount of money that I could borrow was not gonna get me much. Sydney house prices are just absolutely crazy. Um, I just think I'll be staying um, with my parents for quite some time now. Yeah, so I guess I'll probably feel more anxious than like my parents did back in the day. I remember looking back a few years and I wanted to think about like where I would buy a house if I could. And uh, that ring around the city is very quickly becoming bigger and bigger. If I wasn't be able to afford somewhere like, you know, closer to Sydney CBD, it might limit to the things I can do, i.e. I wouldn't be able to, you know, see my friends as much, I wouldn't be able to stay out as late after work and stuff like that. I mean, I would definitely say you're defined a lot by where you live, just in the sense that we live a very busy life and I guess you don't really have a lot of time uh, to yourself to go and travel to places that aren't near your house, I guess. So I guess where you, where you choose to live, I guess whether you like it or not, eventually kind of defines what you end up doing in your free time, what you like to do. I guess accessibility to the uh, infrastructure bits around there, that's going to be important. Um, and even like schools and hospitals and things like that, that would um, factor into my decision in terms of where I want to move. So you've heard there, obviously, 
some, some big topics around affordability, but broader challenges that we've touched on this morning. Um, it's absolutely factoring into people's decision making, what they're looking for around location, lifestyle, good living, um, which really points to the smart design of our cities. So look, thank you for coming this morning. Um, we are committed to starting a campaign on this. Um, we as EY are going to start a campaign on this. We're obviously active in this space. So that looks like approaching government, approaching key stakeholders. There's some great ideas that have come up in the room. So we're going to be doing this. We'd love you to be involved. If you are keen to be involved, get in touch. Uh, but you'll hear more about this conversation. So thanks again for coming this morning and thanks for your contribution.